qui euh, est combiné bien entendu avec euh, le deuxième designer invité et son installation et dans ce, de, dans ce cas Eugenia Morburgo euh, a déjà euh, installé son, son exposition qui est qui, s'il nous reste du temps d'ici 19h on va le visiter par après euh, la conférence d'aujourd'hui c'est effectivement euh, euh, sur les matériaux synthétiques, c'est sera en anglais, j'espère que ce sera pas un problème. Si jamais il y a des mots euh, ou des questions, euh, et Eugenia peut répondre, répondre en français, mais la conférence en soi euh, se déroulera en anglais. Euh, donc la conférence est complémentaire à l'installation qu'elle a préparée dans la maison Foch, et euh, ça ouvre une thématique qui est fondamentale dans l'économie circulaire, c'est-à-dire euh, la polyculture, les matériaux synthropiques, la euh, permaculture et toutes ces thématiques qui euh, sont très importantes et qui, euh, en ces moments, sont euh, souvent pratiquées par euh, des designers et des chercheurs. Donc on, a, on écoute euh, Eugenia nous expliquer euh, sa recherche avec des exemples et des images. Uh, thank you, Eugenia. Welcome to Maison Park. Thank you, Joanna. Hello. Uh, donc, je suis désolée pour la uh, présentation va être tout en anglais et j'espère qu'après je peux essayer d'avoir une conversation avec vous en français. Enfin, on va voir. <laughs> so, today um, I'm gonna introduce you to uh, the research that I'm presenting here in the space, uh, which is called Centropic Materials. But before the, uh, focusing on to that, uh, I would like to give you maybe a very brief introduction of who I am uh, and a project that I did before arriving to this uh, research that I find uh, um, fundamental uh, in, the, in the way I arrived to develop the project uh, That you, that you will see in the exhibition space. I'm Italian, uh, I'm from Venice. Uh, I did uh, a bachelor in industrial design at the University of Venice in Treviso. And then I moved to Holland, to Eindhoven, where I did a master in social design at the Design Academy. After that, I moved to Paris uh, for four years. Uh, and uh, three years ago, I decided to move back to Italy. And I have my own studio uh, where My practice is focusing on uh, researching the impact that uh, production processes uh, can have uh, on society from cultural, environmental, economical impact. So I have a background in industrial design, as I said, uh, where I have learned that uh, design is a practice uh, that is uh, uh, meant to solve existing problems with most, more or less practical solutions. Then when I arrived in Holland, uh, I got introduced to a completely different approach that um, helped me to understand that uh, most of the problems that I was addressing with my practical solutions were part of a much more complex uh, system. And as a designer, uh, I arrived in Eindhoven in 2009, so the practice was also a bit changing, uh, design itself. Um, What I learned in Holland was the idea that I could actually address with my practice these more complex issues that were behind and they were generating the problem that I was addressing with my practical solutions. Uh, my work stands in between craft and open source technologies. Everything I do uh, is shared under Creative Commons licensing. And I really strongly believe in the role that appropriate technology can play inside communities. Mostly in, uh, in the attempt of finding sustain sustainable alternative to the current uh, production methods. So, the project I would like to talk to you about now, it's called uh, Italian Tropics, uh, Fiore di Lotto. And it's, uh, um, it's a project I developed in collaboration with Olivia de Gouveia. She's a designer, a Namibian designer based in Berlin. And, uh, and it's an investigation into the effect that climate change is having on the biodiversity, local economies uh, in Italy right now. 
Specifically, Fiore di Lotto is, uh, is focusing on the almost 100 year presence of the uh, Nelumbo Lucifera, it's the lotus flower, inside the Valle del Mincio wetland, which is a wetland that is bordering the city of Mantova, a city close to Milan, 130 kilometers from Milan. This uh, wetland uh, is uh, one of the most important fresh water inside uh, Italy and uh, it, it, has, uh, it achieved Ramsar uh, protective status in 1971 because of the role it plays uh, in, the, uh, in the migration of birds uh, as a stopover uh, location. In 1921, Maria Pellegheffi, which is a botanist from the University of Parma, a city close by Mantova, decided uh, to transplant a few kilos of lotus rhizomes in the water of the lake to try to test uh, if uh, the lotus could grow in the climate uh, of the north of Italy, inside that wetland. It's 1921, so Italy is going through uh, uh, a phase uh, uh, strongly autarchic, so there is uh, the effort in a lot of different industry to try to look for alternative sources, uh, food and materials uh, that could uh, be produced uh, locally inside the borders uh, of Italy. She plants uh, these few kilos, uh, and just one year after, she leaves, uh, abandoning the experiment uh, and leaving the lotus to, to grow freely. And uh, during these hundred years, what happened is that the species from introduced uh, became uh, uh, an invasive one. Because uh, uh, the lotus was uh, barely contained, uh, it continued to grow, consist together with the consistent rising of temperature in the area and form two almost impenetrable islands inside the lake, as well as several smaller clusters. Due to the biomass deposit of the plant that each year grow, have this uh, seasonal growth which lead them to really overgrow during the spring and summer and then die and deposit under the water level during the winter. In certain locations of the lake, the seabed got raised from three meters up, uh, up to 20 centimeters. This gradual reduction in water level is threatening to, to terrestrialize the whole, uh, the whole wetland area, which is already suffering a lot from, wa from water diverted for industrial agriculture of the, of the area. We are, we, it's good to know also that we are in the center of uh, the Po Valley, which is the most productive uh, agricultural, one of the most productive agricultural area of, of Italy. Um, as a result uh, of the political decision to pursue industrial monoculture in the area, as well as the disappearance of local economy, the landscape is continuing to go uh, a transformation. In the valley there were once uh, a thriving economy, connected to the local reeds and uh, to fishing. But uh, uh, this economic system aimed to protect the land and wildlife uh, while also taking local, pe local people's rights and knowledge and culture into consideration. But around the 60s, with the, the effect of global uh, economic uh, changes, uh, the, uh, the local economy started slowly to disappear and also the relationship between uh, the local citizens, the citizens living around the area and uh, the wetland itself allowing to the decline of uh, the cane, the reeds uh, that were used, that they were once at the core of the, of the crafts, uh, and allowing the lotus uh, to, take, uh, to take space. The valley right now is transformed into a natural protected area, and uh, finds itself regulated uh, disregarding community-based conservation practices. And a new relationship between the inhabitants and the ecosystem is born. The lotus now is at the center of a touristic uh, economy, which is uh, evaluating the beauty of the species, uh, completely disregarding the effect that it actually has on the ecosystem itself. With this research, uh, Italian Tropics Fiore di Lotto, uh, what we try to do, we try to focus on the uh, potential of the biomass of the lotus to develop a new local economy. And looking at, uh, at design as a potential tool for social and ecological <coughs> restoration. We imagined a more hands on bioregional economy by transforming the, uh, the lotus biomass into uh, threads, uh, which is a traditional technique uh, used uh, to produce silk from the stems of the, of the lotus. 
and paper out of the waste uh, from the silk production. For the, pro the project was uh, developed uh, in 2019 for uh, the exhibition Broken Nature, uh, curated by Paolo Antonelli for the Triennale uh, in Milan. The, it was the uh, 22nd Triennale. And uh, we decided to create uh, a botanical illustration that would represent uh, uh, the current status uh, of growth uh, of the lotus uh, inside the lake uh, as an initial step to start a conversation uh, with the local community and try to present uh, uh, everything that was at that point uh, invisible. The invisible uh, uh, reality that stands under the water surface uh, physically, so the condition of the water and uh, the plants, but also the invisible history that, that led to the situation that we are now. So, after this uh, experience, uh, which led me to dive into, first of all, a completely different uh, uh, landscape, which is the uh, Po Valley landscape, which, as I said, is uh, strongly characterized by industrial agricultural monoculture. I uh, decided to start uh, the project Syntropic Materials. Uh, so what is it? Syntropic Materials is an attempt to combine regenerative agricultural practices with the latest development in natural material research in order to design regenerative processes for plant and animal-based material production. I'm going to explain you now through the presentation what do I mean with this. But before, why? Why is it important uh, to look uh, right now at the way natural materials, plant-based materials, uh, are produced? To articulate this motivation, I'm going to read you a little uh, a sentence written by Vandana Shiva, which is uh, a scholar and environmental activist from India. And what she says is, a few centuries of fossil fuel-based civilization are threatening our very survival by rupturing the Earth's carbon cycle. Disrupting, disrupting her key climate system and self-regulatory capacity, and pushing diverse species to the extinction at a thousand times the normal rate. We are in the beginning of the sixth mass extinction. Industrial agriculture based on fossil fuel and toxic chemical is the single biggest contributor to different aspects of the planetary crisis. Climate change, biodiversity erosion, soil desertification, and a water crisis. So in reaction to, to the situation, the environmental situation we're currently in, uh, in the design world, uh, from architecture, design, uh, um, interiors, uh, uh, there has been a strong push to find a sustainable alternative to oil-based uh, materials. Uh, and plant-based materials are often presented as uh, the best alternative we currently have. But to better understand the entanglement uh, between uh, uh, materials and the current environmental crisis, uh, I'm going to show you uh, uh, a series of examples of current material uh, and we are going to look uh, briefly at uh, the, the, the context that stands around the production of this material. Um, for, for synthesis, uh, for need of synthesis, uh, um, I will take the example of fiber production. I will focus only on fiber production, but everything that I'm showing you could uh, easily be applied to other materials, uh, such as plastic, for example, but almost any other material. Also, in this presentation, uh, I choose to focus exclusively on the environmental imp impact of material and also on, on, on the project that you can see in the exhibition. Putting aside the economical, cultural, and social impact, uh, which are anyway very big and not to underestimate. So currently the most used fiber is polyester, which is an oil-based fiber. In 2015 it accounted for 55% of the global milk consumption of fibers and in 2015 they were expecting that by 2030 the demands would be close to 70 million tons. But if we look at the data right now it already went much higher. Polyester is one of those fibers that is often presented as a sustainable fiber because it is 100% recyclable, which is, it means that it is circular. 
Um, but if we look at the actual data, only 10% of clothing waste end up being recycled. 57 end up in the landfill and 25% is incinerated and only 8% is reused. So the recycling part is uh, it's kind of minimal. Even if we would uh, uh, create a system that would change this scenario, so that would lead the more waste stream of polyester into recycling, something that we need also to take into consideration, that one of the major issues with synthetic fiber, it's, uh, it's, it's not much in the end of life of the product, but it's, it's in the use of the product itself. Uh, so, in general, the synthetic and non-biodegradable fiber are connected uh, to, to one, of, uh, one of the big issues of plastic pollution uh, right now. Each time an item is washed, it releases a thousands of microfibers. Microfibers are pieces of plastics which are smaller than one millimeter in diameter. And through the washing system, they find their ways in the water system and to, to the rivers and, uh, and to the oceans. It's estimated that uh, washing synthetic fiber releases almost 35% of the microplastics that we're currently seeing in, uh, in the marine habitats around the world takes a big part of it. A problem is that once microfiber are in the ocean, they act like sponges and they attract all the chemicals that you can find in polluted water. And they are also so tiny that uh, they, they become part of the uh, food cycle and they are eaten by the smallest animals that are eaten by the larger animals that end up on, on our table. So, by being part of the chain, what they bring is not only the pieces of plastic, but the chemicals that are attached to the plastic and that arrive uh, through the chain to us too. And if we think that uh, uh, avoiding eating fish uh, is a good solution, uh, it's good to know also that um, uh, research, researchers shows that microplastic and microfibers are present in 90% of salt sampled from around the world. So microplastics is kind of everywhere. In reaction to all of this, a lot of investment has been placed into alternative renewable resources. Renewable and biodegradable or compostable. Just a, a precision that like, yeah. Renewable materials are those which can be manufactured or generated quickly enough to keep pace with how fast they are used. Biodegradable is the naturally occurring breakdown of materials into carbon dioxide, water and biomass by a microorganism such as bacteria and fungi. I choose to stop a second on this because usually when we speak about material, often we generally talk about biomaterial. Either because they are renewable or because they are biodegradable, but there are two different concepts that have two different implications. So, if we look at biodegradable materials, uh, in, the, in this case fibers, uh, cotton is the, is the one that, it's, uh, that, we're gonna, that I'm going to talk to you about because it covers 81% of the natural fiber produced uh, uh, right now. Around 99% of the world cotton farmers, which are displaced around 70 countries, uh, produce 75% of the 25 million metric tons which are usually produced. Which I think it's important to notice uh, because when we speak about uh, farming for uh, materials, uh, we often uh, uh, end up uh, easily into the idea that we have uh, big farms, uh, uh, industrial scale farming, uh, which needs to be addressed uh, as uh, the objective for finding a solution for sustainable materials. But actually the infrastructure that we have now for producing uh, biodegradable textile, it's based on small farms, small farmers. Cotton covers 3% of the world cultivated land, but it accounts on 24% of global ins insecticides use. And it's also one of the most uh, water-intensive crop uh, that we have. Of the four cotton species uh, that we cultivate for fibers, uh, the most important is Gossipo Mirsutum, which is a Mexican uh, species. 
which produces 90% of the world cotton, and it's mostly grown in uh, monocultural systems. So, uh, the correlation between monoculture, biodiversity loss, water pollution, soil depletion, and lack of resilience in climate change, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's kind of known. I'm not gonna uh, dive in, into that. And it's recognized also by international organizations such as the World Agriculture Organization, which uh, I wouldn't define as extremist uh, organizations. Uh, also, um, when we are looking at monoculture and we're looking at this system which use uh, mainly one species, what we're seeing is uh, not only a monoculture in land management, so one plant in one field, but we're looking also at a genetic monoculture. So the seeds come all from one genetic uh, strut. Uh, so, for example, 93% of the Indian cotton uh, is produced uh, with the use of Bt cotton uh, from uh, Monsanto seeds. In reaction to, to all of these uh, polyester cotton, uh, in the past 10 years uh, we have been witnessing an attempt to look into alternative sources for natural materials. We have looked at the effort in looking at all species, also from the Food, World of, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, with the programs that try uh, to, to, to facilitate and invest the use of species that are traditionally used uh, in different regions of the world. One of these, for example, is abaca, which is a, a banana plant that doesn't produce uh, uh, bananas, but only fibers, and is traditionally used in the Philippines uh, and is transformed through mechanical processes and is used to produce uh, uh, paper, uh, ropes, uh, insulation materials, uh, and it's uh, widespread. Um, Banana Tex, which is a company from uh, Switzerland, it's a, it, this is the first circular schemes that we're gonna see, and we're gonna see some others, um, which we're gonna, I'm gonna try to show you, from my opinion, certain aspects that maybe stands behind uh, this uh, type of narrative. Um, so Banana Tex use Abaca has uh, uh, developed a full process, uh, first uh, mechanically, uh, mechanically extracting the fibers, transforming it into paper, paper to thread, and then uh, in, uh, uh, taking care also of the production of garment. And as this image of circularity, what is said is because the fiber is biodegradable, it can end up uh, back as a fertilizer in the cultivation of abaca. It's a suggestion. I don't think they mean really that the bag goes in the roots of the abaca, but it's a suggestion of a, of a circle. But actually, the whole process, if we look when it, where it happens, uh, plants are grown in the Philippines, uh, my, uh, the, the fiber is milled, uh, produced in uh, milling facilities in Taiwan, the objects are produced in China, then the products are distributed all over the world. So. It's, it's the, the locality of where these things happen is also something maybe to, to, to question. Another uh, example is uh, uh, the role that uh, eucalyptus plants are playing uh, in the development of new materials right now. Uh, eucalyptus, this is eucalyptus globulus, it's a plant coming from uh, Australia, and now it's commonly grown uh, in monoculture, in uh, South America and a lot also in Portugal. Uh, it's, it grows fast, and you can cut it to the bottom and it's gonna grow again, which is amazing because it means that you're not, as investment, you're not replanting, uh, which is also addressed as something that accounts for the sustainability of, the, of these plants. Then it's easily transformed into pulp, paper, and then a fiber production. Uh, Tencel, which is one of, uh, of the brands that is producing this type of, uh, of fiber, it's now uh, promoted by big brands. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of presented as the new sustainable textile. But the, the way it's grown, it's uh, in, uh, either in Brazil or in, uh, in Portugal, uh, it's mainly grown into, in monoculture. This is uh, an image uh, which uh, different associations that are working uh, with uh, uh, farmers that are farming in monoculture uh, eucalyptus are defining as green deserts. They look, uh, they are green, they are, look like a forest, but if you look at the level of biodiversity that you can find in a forest like this, it's very low. It would be like if, if it is 
actually a desert. And the, what's the, the problem with this is that uh, um, another of the narrative that is that we hear often uh, right now is the idea that the reforestation is a tool for um, fighting against uh, CO2 emission for the carbon sequestration role that uh, trees can have. And often these type of strategies are even presented as potential alternative to native forests because we create a forest that is actually productive, so we have an economical uh, uh, profit out of it, but is not again considering the consequences at the level of the biodiversity of the ecosystem. Um, this is a life cycle assessment of a comparison of uh, uh, cotton and the uh, eucalyptus fiber. And we can see the parameters that are often used. So it's about water and CO2 and soil consumption. And what I believe, it, what I suggest is that we actually should start addressing the fact that we need also to consider the biodiversity uh, conservation, the soil fertility, other parameters, but many more parameters in evaluating actually which material become more or less sustainable. Uh, another major issue when looking at uh, um, material uh, derived from uh, uh, plant-based materials is the land use. So this is a, a scheme uh, that is focusing on bioplastic, uh, but what we see is that most of the soil is not used to produce uh, materials. It's used for um, pasture, mainly, uh, and then uh, for food production. And because we know that there is, it's an issue also to expand the use of soil, uh, another direction that has been uh, strongly pushed is the idea of uh, looking at agricultural byproduct. Uh, as a source of biomass for producing uh, natural materials. This led for the, to the, for the development of new materials and open, and open up uh, to new species uh, that before were not considering as a potential source uh, of biomass for material production. We have seen uh, uh, leather insulation materials and hardboards developed uh, uh, from sunflower uh, stalk uh, in the south of France. Uh, bioplastic developed from uh, potato skins in England, threads out of orange peels in Italy, plastic fibers and paper out of sugarcane in Brazil, or leather from uh, barberry fig leaf in Mexico, and uh, uh, fibers, uh, textile and alternative leather from pineapple leaves in the Philippines. So what, what they present is, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very diverse landscape of, of plants, uh, that are strongly also connected to bioregional uh, economies. And these are just a few examples. Uh, the pineapple leaves, for example, uh, it's a traditional technique from, uh, from the Philippines, out of which threads is produced. And Pinatex, uh, uh, it's a company which is now producing an alternative leather out of the fibers uh, um, produced with the extracted from the leaf of the pineapple. This is another nice circular uh, representation of the production process, which explains every step of how, how it's made. Uh, but again, it, it misses out a few details. The fact that uh, um, PLA, which is uh, a bioplastic, is completely part of the process, and it doesn't look at the origin of these uh, leaves, which is Monocultural, monoculture production of, uh, of pineapple. The same can be seen for orange fiber produced in the south of Italy. The orange industry in the south of Italy is one of the industries uh, which, if we look at uh, work condition, uh, we, we can easily speak about uh, slavery, uh, current days uh, slavery. And it's amazing that now we can produce fiber out of, uh, out of orange peel and that we have this idea of, uh, of, of reusing the waste, uh, but a focus uh, on also the context where these raw materials are coming from, I, I, I find it uh, important. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, this, uh, this new narrative, it's a little bit confusing uh, what we define as extractive and what we define as renewable. 
we call all of these renewable material, but actually the impact that we're having on the landscape, on the uh, on the land, it's it's more extractive rather than than re renewable. And what I'm suggesting is that we should actually look at regeneration as a practice. Uh, as an agricultural practice, as a source, and, and try to start developing regenerative process rather than only renewable. So regenerative agriculture is a series of, series of agricultural practices which focus on uh, the regeneration of soil, uh, facilitate biodiversity, um, improving the water cycle, uh, enhancing ecosystem services, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, positive aspects of land management. And uh, maybe one of the most common regenerative agricultural practices is permaculture. I think it's commonly known, but part of this big umbrella of regenerative agriculture, there is a lot of other practices such as agroforestry, silvopasture, and also syntropic farming. Something that is also important to know is that most of these practices have a strong base into uh, indigenous knowledge, no matter where they are uh, developed. Uh, Worldwide. Me specifically, I've been looking into syntropic farming to start this, uh, this research because uh, syntropic farming is an agroforestry model that has been developed by the Swiss farmer and researcher and Scotch. And so it's agroforestry, which means that uh, you are growing trees with crops. You have uh, both uh, typologies. Um, and syntropic farming in particular tried to mimic the forest interdependent relationship, plants relationship, replicating and accelerating natural processes. So it's based a lot on observation and, and repeating what, what happened in, uh, inside natural forest. Processes such as the ecological stratification, so the vertical layering of the habitat, and ecological succession, which is the process of changing the species structure in an ecological community over time. Syntropic farming is it's a polyculture, so you have different type of species that try to foster biodiversity, establish highly productive agricultural area, so the focus it is about productivity. But agricultural area which tend to be independent from input and irrigation. Input uh, we mean fertilizer, pesticide, and it, uh, uh, farmers which practice in tropic farming uh, state that uh, the objective is to transform uh, depleted land into self-sufficient uh, uh, forests. So out of these syntropic materials, the project that you can see in the exhibition is born, and uh, syntropic material ask uh, as, uh, kind of a simple question. Can we design plant animal based materials starting from agricultural byproducts uh, which comes from polyculture, polyculture and agroforestal systems? My battery is low, it's the, the thing is plugged. So the project stands uh, in between regenerative polycultures uh, and plant-based uh, uh, material innovation. Um, so, contrary to, to monoculture, which allows to produce a high quantity of one resource, uh, polycultures produce a low quantity of a big diversity. And uh, uh, usually when polyculture is designed for food production, uh, plants are selected with the ability of enriching the ecosystem, so working with each other, but also according to the needs of offering a balanced diet, mostly when the scale is, uh, is a smaller scale. But when we speak about material production, something that we need to take into consideration is the process. So from 
from the cotton balls on the plant till the actual um, t-shirt in the shop, uh, materials goes through a lot of processes, different processes. So uh, if uh, we would consider uh, farmers uh, um, producing materials out of agricultural fields, then what we would imagine is that then they would have to rely to different transformation processes, which if we look at uh, um, the economy of scale, it would easily become economically not viable, mostly because uh, uh, farmers are often not the uh, subject of the transformation processes, but they are part of an infrastructure. So you would have to have different relationship with different uh, companies uh, to produce, so it would uh, hardly work. So what I'm suggesting is that when designing a polyculture field for materials, uh, species can be selected for their ability to enrich the ecosystem, but under the condition of belonging to the same production process. So can we imagine uh, grow uh, so bus fibers such as flax, uh, nettle and hemp uh, are transformed with the same type of machinery. There is details that are different, but the, the more or less the processes are quite comparable. So can we imagine them part of the same ecosystem producing threads, insulation and structural bores based on mixed fiber of these fibers? Or oh, how would a starch-based bioplastic be made uh, if we start considering starch extracted from different species? Can we imagine new reinforced composite materials starting from plants which produce fiber and plants which produce binding agents uh, growing in the same ecosystem? In order to develop this research, I, what I realized is that I could address it from two perspectives. One was uh, uh, analyzing polyculture or starting from the knowledge I have on, on materials as my background in, in design. So. Uh, I started with materials. <laughs> and to start addressing these questions uh, in, the, in the past uh, uh, months, uh, I, uh, I designed uh, a library, which uh, is uh, online and is accessible uh, for everyone. What you will find online, if you will go, is uh, the first iteration of what I hope is going to evolve uh, into a much more complex database. Um, so what I did is starting archiving information on species and uh, the materials uh, they can be transformed uh, into. But because it's, it's the fact that they need to belong to the same type of ecosystem, what you can do is to actually browse through this information by climatic zones. So, Um, in this case, for example, uh, is the database filter by uh, Zone 8, which is uh, uh, this type of uh, climatic area we, we, we find ourselves. I'm using hardness zone uh, system, which is a type of uh, classification um, that indicates uh, the uh, best condition for, for the growth uh, of a plant. It's the first specification that I, I decided to use, uh, but I'm open and uh, open to question also the fact that I choose to use this, uh, this type of classification system right now. Uh, what happened to you when you approach the library is that you are exposed to every information there is in the database about the climatic zone you find yourself in. So if usually you would imagine that a material library would start by you selecting what you're, what's your interest in, you're interested in plastic, you're interested in colors, you're interested in one plant per se, this database is exposing you to the whole uh, spectrum, the whole landscape, the widest possibilities, and then it's up to you to start filtering because what I'm suggesting is that you're supposed to actually start considering the coexistence of species, uh, of species together for the production of materials. So you can start filtering from species or you can start filtering from materials. And every information that you find, uh, that you find on the website, uh, it's, uh, it's actually a link to content that is present online. That means that the database is not a repository of data where I'm actually editing and filtering and choosing what are the information, but it's more a place where I'm bringing information that are already existing 
and trying to build new connection between, creating novel connection between them. Um, because of this, what I also choose to do is not to focus only on industrially manufactured products or established already uh, processes uh, for material transformation, but I, uh, I have a spectrum of resources which goes from the more uh, do-it-yourself tutorial on how to create dyes uh, from a specific plant to industrial manufacturing that are already on the market with this type of materials to more experimental projects that are now uh, developed by, by designers such as uh, this, uh, for example, MDF made with uh, um, Japanese knotweed, which is an invasive species developed inside a fab lab uh, in Belgium. So one of the purposes is also to bring together in one location the references to all these different knowledge to start creating new connections between them. This is still a work in progress and, uh, and what, I will, what I hope I will be able to do in the next uh, months also in collaboration with the different partners is, is start to adding level of complexity on this first level of, uh, of information. Another way um, to address this, uh, the, the, to address the research for me was to start looking at existing polycultures uh, and make sen sense of them. These are all informations, uh, the database and the actual uh, uh, ecosystem that I'm gonna present you right now that you can see in the exhibition space. So I decided to look at the Milpa food forest, which is uh, um, traditional uh, um, agricultural practices, practice from uh, uh, Mesoamerica, which is a cyclical agricultural practice. It, uh, it, it lasts around 20 years and it starts from a field of crops and slowly it becomes a forest, which at the end of the cycle it's cut to the ground the soil, the, the, the biomass left on the ground is burned and after a few years of resting the soil, it starts again as a cycle. For me, this, I, I choose to select this type of example, first of all, because it's one of the polyculture that has the most uh, information on. It has been studied by a lot of different disciplines. And because it's a contained system, it's, it begins and it ends. And so in this complexity of information, at least here I had uh, an example that, that had limits around, so I could address. It's an ecosystem which uh, uh, the studies shows that it can ha be enriched with up to 90 like, different species, but for my first analysis I decided to focus on 13 specific species, which are the ones that are more recurrent uh, in the uh, literature that it's analyzing uh, the, the Milpa forest. Uh, so as I said, there is a first phase where you have mostly crops, corn, beans, squash, uh, amaranto, uh, tomato, potato. And then you have uh, fruit trees, banana, mango, avocado, papaya, and then you have timber trees. So what I did was, for every species, for every of the 13 species, I tried to look at what is commonly, what is currently known about those plants for material production. So are there current companies that are producing something with byproducts or with parts of these species? Do we have tradition in producing uh, uh, materials out of these? Or are there designers that are experimenting with it? And what you can see in the exhibition is the actual physical samples of, uh, that you can see now on the screen that are all the materials that are produced out of these pieces, from paper, fibers, insulation materials, uh, dyes, uh, timber, veneer, uh, bioplastics. Uh. And, but again, what, what uh, as, as a first step, because it's a long-term research, uh, for what, what was important for me is to try to make sense of the information that I had and try to look at the, the cycle, so something that lasts for a certain amount of time and change through time, and try to understand if 
if we look at it uh, through the information that we have about the species, we can start uh, creating uh, uh, a rational, uh, rational maybe is not the right word, but a sense uh, of uh, what could it be producing uh, along the time, al along the whole period of the 20 years. So for example, if we look at paper production, we, knows that, uh, we know that uh, from zero up to 10 years, paper can be produced uh, and can be produced from uh, three different species. So if I have this information, my next step would be if I have an actual ecosystem that works this way, can I start producing paper out of these three species together? And maybe the first five years I know that I would be producing paper only from maize and tomato, but then banana fiber would come in. And this goes along with the color production, textile, so I know and I can have an understanding of uh, the productivity, not anymore of a field which I'm planning and that lasts uh, the time of growth of the plant and then is reduced to zero and starts again, but something that lasts for a much longer time span and evolve as an ecosystem, as a whole ecosystem. Plastic, particle board, timber. I think this is somewhat interesting also to see inside the exhibition. And then this finally gives me an idea that actually if I want to produce material out of an ecosystem like this, for the old period I can produce materials which are different, but that I know that for the old period I would be able to produce color, plastic and veneer, and not for the old period, but for a big part of it I would be able to produce paper, textile, and then at the end timber. So, looking at this, it, uh, it means that I'm, I'm obliged to rethink about the whole system and, uh, and I have different parameters that I need to start to take into consideration, which have, opens a lot of opportunities, but also presents a lot of risk. I'm gonna just point to a few and then we're gonna close. First of all, time. So the system is based on species succession, which means that the landscape, as I said, is changing through time. It's changing through season and it's changing through the years. So how do I start designing materials uh, or designing processes for material production which have to adjust uh, through times and needs to be flexible and change to a different stream of biomass that will come in? How do spaces that produce this type of material needs to change? Are we looking more at industry? We're looking more at farm as examples uh, for rethinking the spaces where these materials are produced? How do policies uh, related to these materials are gonna have to change? Most of material is, uh, that we currently use, not all the material we could use, are standardized materials. We come from standardized sources and has been uh, certified. How do you certify something that change through time? But it opens up to also possibilities such as diversity, diversity in the species, but also genetic diversity. If we look at uh, researches on food production right now, this is a, uh, uh, a line of research that is very active. Uh, currently in Italy, that's where I come from, and maybe I have the most knowledge about, but I'm sure that in France there is a lot of this too. Uh, you have a lot of attention in trying to rediscover antique grains. So grains that were one used, that have lower presence of uh, uh, gluten. gluten. Uh, <laughs> but, this type of different plants needs different machines to be harvested. They have different height, they're not standardized, the, 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 the chemical composition is different. So again, all the process needs to change. So when we're imagining a polyculture that can be locally processed with accessible technology, what I think is that we are, what we're actually doing is looking to the past. So, we, we saw the example of the Maya forest garden, which is something that is very far, but if we look at Europe, we also have this history and we do have this uh, type of approach inside our farms. Uh, this is an image from, uh, hemp, from Italy where uh, hemp threads were produced and they were manufactured inside the, in, inside the farm. Monoculture was already part of the system, but polyculture was always present uh, around farms for producing the products that would have to be consumed inside the, inside the farm.
We have a, a historical tradition of uh, this, is, this is called the, the married wine. It's uh, uh, wine trees that were growing on, uh, on trees and it's a tradition that comes from uh, Etruscan uh, agriculture that is still common and it was common in Italy until the 50s before it got uh, before industrialization processes in the agricultural fields uh, uh, entered the place and, and, and transformed everything uh, uh, from trees to cement uh, support. Something that we have to be careful also when we when we are trying to develop this new approach uh, is is looking at where do we take the knowledge for developing these new systems. I uh, presented you uh, more in depth research into uh, the Maya forest garden, which is an indigenous practice. So knowledge appropriation is a concept that I believe it's uh, very important to address when we are developing new agricultural practices for material production and new processes for material transformation. And this is something that uh, uh, that happen, uh, happen all along the line. It happens from uh, seed use and the selection of which seeds we want to use for producing material. We have infinite amount of examples of uh, corporation uh, um, taking uh, uh, indigenous seeds and patenting them and protecting them. So knowledge and rights appropriation processes too. And, clearly also the culture that stands behind these uh, transformations and in the use of these new these materials. This type of approach also, it's, uh, it's part, it needs to, I believe, needs to, to question uh, which side it takes in the big discussion of health, earth and shared planets, which are conservation uh, different approaches. Of course, the idea that we would that for a sustainable future we should divide the earth in two and have one that is based on conservation and one that is used and it's maximized. It has a maximization of production. Shared planet is the idea that as human we are part of the environment we are engaging and it's just a matter of the way we are engaging with the environment right now, that it's a problem. We need to be careful about the objectification of nature. I, what I definitely did with all these analyses is uh, uh, trying to uh, present how much we can extract from each of these species. But if we want to change, and we want to develop more sustainable approaches, we also need to start defining uh, what is the relationship that we are having with the ecosystem that we are creating. And we also need to be aware of uh, uh, of existing infrastructure and how do we relate to it, um, such as regenerative capitalism, for example. Me, personally, I see a lot of potential in open source and uh, uh, commons practices, um, which could facilitate the development of local by regional economies. Um, and Currently, uh, open, open source technology are already playing uh, an important role from, uh, from seeds to, to material production. Uh, maybe it's not the best way to define uh, seed banks as open source practices, but it is, the philosophy it is very common on the idea that uh, uh, community seed banks, not uh, uh, private seed banks, but community seed banks uh, are places uh, where we are commonly storing uh, genetical knowledge about seeds which clearly is connected to everything from the seeds to the, to the materials. Uh, communities or farmers are engaging with open source communities uh, and uh, are redesigning agricultural machines and sharing online uh, um, their expertise and their, tech, their technical uh, development uh, to produce highly customizable uh, machines that will then more easily uh, transform these species that we want to work with, using uh, tools as digital fabrication also. And farm hack uh, it's, uh, it's only one of the, of the examples, uh, but there are a lot of uh, uh, platforms online where farmers are exchanging information and using technology for uh, 
addressing uh, problems of, uh, of scales uh, in, uh, in, in farming uh, until the end of, of material production. So material, for example, it's uh, I guess one of the latest platform that is addressing this, but it's a, it's a community of designers and engineers that are developing new materials starting from waste and are sharing online uh, the recipes. And in, with the, uh, as, as it happens in most uh, open source community, the idea is that uh, you go there, you have access to information, you build on it, and you reshare the information. So it's an independent, uh, it, it's, it's a development of alternative materials which doesn't happen inside necessarily of companies, but it's outside and out of uh, uh, then, uh, the risk of uh, patenting innovation also in the material. Term. So what I showed you, it's really a work in progress. I started in uh, 2000, September 2019 at the American Academy in Rome, thanks to a fellowship of four months where I was supported to structure the whole research and start it. And I'm going to start in November 2020 a six months residency at the Academy of Solitude in Germany, which is going to give me another big, good amount of time to uh, dive into the research. But in between, I managed to, de to, to, to develop different type of collaboration, such as the one with the, uh, the Maison Poc, Giovanna, World Design Capital, which are allowing me to support the project and experiment with different contexts, such a different aspect of the project, such as uh, dissemination or actual research through workshops, through exhibitions, uh, and through more specific uh, collaborations. So it's a work in progress. The online, uh, you can find the website with all the information uh, that I share with you today, the database, which it's the biggest work in progress, and it's, it's also a tool for me to start a conversation with, the, um, this, with, with different professionals from different disciplines and have feedback on, on what I'm working on right now. And, um, so, thank you for listening, and uh, I, ho I hope it was interesting and clear. I know. <laughs> C'est vrai aussi garder un peu de temps pour la visite de l'expo parce que c'est une belle occasion. C'est une expo qui rentre dans une valise. Déjà, ça, c'est. Thank you, uh, Virginia. Uh, I think it was really nice to discover the project. And all this research. I have a question about the ambition of the project because as you said it is really a long-term research project and it will be constructed with fellowship to continue to develop like new tools. But I was wondering like is it a lifetime project because when you look at like also like this uh, cycle of this forest I guess like you need also time to investigate the possibility of how could it be implemented? So I'm curious to know about how much will you devote time to this project, to a life? And I was also thinking like, do you want to build this forest yourself? Or is there a place where you would like to investigate like uh, in reality the, the project? So that's the question. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, yes. It is a very long-term project, and I was very attracted to it. Like when I started thinking about it, uh, it, it, it really convinced me. Also because it works on a different scale than all the projects that I did now. I was finding also a bit frustrating idea that you always have to finish a project, and with this, I don't think I can see an end to it because I am uh, depending from. A rhythm that is not the one I can choose, but it's uh, the time of growth of uh, cycles of plants. And so, for the moment, I mean, I, 
it's hard to say what's gonna happen in the, in the future. But uh, I would like to keep working on it for a very, very long time, probably in different ways. Um, and and the ambition it is to to not do it alone. It's it's not about now now what I've done. It's in conversation with the different professionals, but it's not in collaboration yet. And uh, so one of the goals is to actually develop more stable collaboration with uh, agronomists, uh, with companies that want to experiment and want to actually have uh, case studies and practical studies. Uh, because it's, it's fundamental also for the development of the research itself. You can go with the imagination and theory just a certain extent. I am uh, finding positive feedback from uh, uh, schools and from companies that actually want to test it, uh, which is nice and uh, uh, give me kind of hope that I will be able to, to, to have it. And uh, I also would like to to be involved uh, more in the actual practical uh, side of it. So, piece of land uh, actually harvesting, or at least in the, the, in the development of the production processes that will come out of this. Yeah, I think. La générosité de Eugenia est incroyable, donc si vous avez des questions, mais vous voulez encore les, les élaborer chez vous, euh, vous nous envoyez un mail et on va euh, le transmettre à Eugenia. Hein? Et donc, euh, je souligne le fait que toute sa recherche est open source, donc c'est disponible à, à partir du site internet euh, euh, qui, est, euh, qui a été affiché, mais qui se retrouvera, se, se retrouve dans l'expo. Euh, vous êtes des, des étudiants en design, juste par euh, curiosité, la plupart, oui. Donc euh, c'est très bien parce qu'on a, on a vraiment, vraiment besoin de ce genre de réflexion et, et vous avez aussi le temps de le développer. Euh, voilà, donc on va visiter l'expo, exceptionnellement parce qu'on est déjà euh, hors euh, horaire d'ouverture, mais ce serait la manière la plus efficace pour terminer la séance. Merci beaucoup.